so today's message, I'm going to paint a little bit of a backdrop uh, using the story of Joseph. Um, I find his story one of intrigue. You know, the story, in the story, he's the younger brother, um, and he's deeply loved and set apart from birth. He follows the line of succession from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And I'm not going to get into all the background information, but at 17 years old, he has a dream and vision where he essentially tells his brothers and his parents that they're going to bow down to him and they're going to be at his mercy, which wasn't received very well. Yeah, and I, I'm just wondering, you know, the story kind of picks up with him at 17. I'm like, what was, this, what was this dude like before 17? What was he like before all this happened? Because, man, when he burst onto the scene, it's, it's uncomfortable. And if there's one thing that really hasn't changed over, you know, thousands of years is we know that teenagers say and do some of the dumbest things known to mankind because we've all been there before. We know. Uh, and the proof is out there, too. It's not hard to find, Right. We see it on social media, and it's true for adults, too. I don't want to just beat up teenagers, right? I'd get in trouble for that. <clears throat> so as we di- dive into the message, I'm going to read you a little bit more of the story. Starting in Genesis 37, uh, verse 23, it says, When Joseph arrived, so this is after he had told them, Hey, uh, I've, I'm having these dreams and these visions, right? And in these dreams and visions, you're going to be bowing down to me. I'm going to be superior to you. So they're all plotting against him. What are we going to do to this young man? So when he arrives, his brothers are, are near Dothan, so don't go near that place. When, they, when he arrives, his brothers grab him. They rip off the robe he was wearing. They threw him in a cistern, and now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, while our friend Joseph is in the pit, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelites, tra- our Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Now Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, so his brothers agreed. I'm wondering, what were these brothers like too? Man, they're not very nice. Either that or Joseph really ticked them off far beyond the the start of the story. So his brothers agreed. No one really stepped up and said anything about it. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, which would equate to about $200 today. And the traders took him to Egypt. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was the captain of the palace guard. And we'll kind of pick up that story in a moment. But what we know just so far is his brothers have had enough. So they throw him into pit and they sell him into slavery. And not to make light of the situation, because it's not, it's not a very glamorous or fun situation, but have any of you ever taken a long road trip with kids before? Right? Now, I, I have young kids, so I, I'm very familiar with how crazy it can get and how chaotic it can get. Now, I, I had the luxury, I, I, if you want to call it that, I had the luxury of doing that with other people's kids as a youth pastor. And it's the worst. <laughs> When it's your own kids, you know, you could kind of get after them a little bit. But when it's other people's kids, like, you have to be, I mean, you can't say anything too crazy or it's going to come back to bite you. But by the time you reach your destination, you are done. And I think the kids feel the same way about the adults, too, just to be fair. But do you see what the Midianites do here? It's kind of, to me, it's kind of funny. Even they get tired of Joseph. They're like, man, we've had this guy for a little bit, and we're done with him, too. So we're going to sell him as well. So this poor kid winds up in Egypt and through a series of otherworldly events becomes second in command to Pharaoh. His story doesn't start with the pit, but the pit, the cistern, is where the transformation begins. You see, even after all these really awful events take place, you see God with him every step of the way. From the pit to being enslaved, 
to being put in charge of Potiphar's household, to being wrongly accused of sexual advances on Potiphar's wife, which led to his imprisonment. You know, we're going to pick up right there because I think there's, there's a little bit more to share in this story. So starting in, in verse 20, a little bit later, it says Joseph, they, they took Joseph and threw him in the prison after this had all taken place where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And I think that's kind of important. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Some time later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Pharaoh became so angry with these two officials, he put them in the prison where Joseph was, in the palace of the captain guard. They remained in prison for quite some time, and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, crazy, who looked after them. While they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and the baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both, both looked upset. So he asked them, why do you look so worried today? And they replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. And here comes our friend Joseph. Interpreting dreams is God's business, he replied, go ahead and tell me your dreams. Dreams are getting this bad boy in trouble. That's where it all started. So what does Joseph do? He interprets the dream. He essentially tells the cupbearer, hey, you know, it's all good. You're going to be fine. Um, but don't forget me when you're restored back to your position. And now to the chief baker, and this is the reason why we don't have pictures today, <laughs> it's not very good news. Now he gets impaled. I, I don't want to display that. I don't think anybody would enjoy that. So here we are. All these things are happening to him, and he's completely abandoned after rescuing Pharaoh's cupbearer, where he spent an additional two years in prison because our dude, the cupbearer, was probably experiencing some pretty high anxiety and likely PTSD after going back to Pharaoh after his buddy, the baker, was just impaled. So we can't blame the guy for kind of forgetting what had happened. He has a lot going on and a lot on his plate. So here we have Joseph, imprisoned, forgotten, abandoned, and not wanted. But that's not the end of the story. We know that. His story was still being written, and God was right there in the midst of it all. Pharaoh ends up having a dream that needs an interpreter. The cupbearer remembers Joseph. Joseph interprets the dream, and then boom. Our guy is number two in all of Egypt overseeing the land. This story is incredibly bizarre. And it's wild when you think about all the different things that are happening with it. And if you're unfamiliar with the story, Genesis, it's in Genesis 37 and beyond. You can check that out when you get home. But back to the story. Let's not forget that this all transpired when he was 17 years old. And by the time we get to where he's put in charge of all the land, he's now in his mid to late 30s, cl probably closer to 40 years old, before he's reconciled with his family. That's 23 years of growth, 23 years of struggle, 23 years of bettering him, himself in spite of his circumstances, in which none of it was really his fault. Now, I, I can't say that we have gone through similar experiences. That would be pretty wild if that was true. But I can guarantee that for most of us, if not all of us, we all have a thrown in the pit story. I'm sure some of it was by our own doing and our own unraveling. And other times we're just honestly a victim of someone else's wrongs. Either way, none of it, none of it is easy. And it's only fair to lose heart, to lose faith, to lose trust. But somewhere along the way we recognize the gift of God's presence like that in the middle of that pit, in the middle of all this chaos, we see a glimpse of light that rekindles that feeling of hope that was once so familiar, and then we begin to feel that gentle peace that passes all understanding. We know this, that the journey of following Jesus, it, it has a lot of twists and turns. 
And as we learn, as we grow, as we develop in our, our, our beliefs, we face the ne- inevitable series of questions about faith where we have to break things down to the foundation and really start asking questions and rebuilding. Um, I, I believe, <clears throat> this, is, this, this is me, all right? I believe one of the biggest errors of Christianity is the sin of certainty. And what I mean by that is just simply this. It doesn't offer a lot of room for questions, especially when you're in the midst of something deep. And, it, it, and when you're in the middle of that, when you're asking questions, you know, for a lot of people, doubt is looked at as this shameful, guilt-ridden thing. Like, you're not allowed to ask any questions, otherwise you're not a strong Christian. And what this does is it leads to doing more, or trying more, or trying to, like, we're trying to perform, essentially, where our faith becomes transactional. Like, uh, let me see how much I can do, and maybe something will change. Or it becomes performance-based. And that's not what Christianity is about. And what that leads to is a spiritual pit. And I've been there before. I'm all too familiar with it. But that's where transformation happens. Our story and our journey only really begins when we experience difficulty like that. When we experience the dirt, the mud, and the muck. And from that point, we have to be proactive in asking questions and seeking answers and being okay with not knowing or being okay with being wrong and having the elasticity to grow and stretch ourselves. It takes a whole lot of humility and an open mind and heart to do that. Now, I, as I shared earlier, I was talking about the song, Blessed Be Your Name. You know, I haven't been shy in sharing some of my story. And I've tried to be open and vulnerable um, when doing so because I know that some people might benefit from hearing a little bit of that. So my, my faith journey re- only really began when I look back at my life. It really only began taking root when I was faced with the question of God's goodness and his love as a teenager. I was a sophomore in high school, and it was the first time I really, like, really, really felt pain and grief and sorrow on a deep, deep level. Losing my stepdad to cancer opened me up to a world I didn't know existed. And that led me to some difficult questions. But it was only just the beginning. This had put me in the pit. Fast forward a few years later, when I was in ministry in central Kentucky, married just over a year, and a baby just a few months old, I'm blindsided by a church I thought was home. By people that pride themselves in saying, we are a place to call home and people to call family. They told me I wasn't doing enough. You know, they, they kept asking the question, why isn't the student ministry growing? Why aren't you doing all the events we want you to do? Why aren't you spending enough time with other families, with kids, with students? You know, mind you, I was at the church 40 hours a week on average. On top of that, running programs for the kids from diapers to seniors in high school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday nights. I was attending youth concerts, musicals, performances, sporting events, running events monthly for the older kids, every other month for the elementary kids, and quarterly for the youngsters, and on top of that, home visits, hospital visits, prayer meetings, and minister meetings. I was spending an easy 65 to 70 hours away from home, away from my family, and I wasn't doing enough. This had me questioning the church and my role in it, and it put me in the pit. I've had other moments, I won't dive into all that for the sake of brevity, but there are moments and experience where, man, they're just, they're just gut-wrenching, you know? They're the type of moments that force you into a pit. They force you to ask questions, and it really puts God on a trial. If you ever wonder if it's okay to ask questions of God or to be angry or upset uh, or to feel hurt or abandoned, I I think you're in good company because the Old Testament is full of stories like that. And you, you begin to ask questions like, is this really a part of God's plan? Or is there really a lesson to be taught through this? Or was there something I did? Was there some kind of sin I committed for all these things to be happening? You know, is this my fault? Or what kind of loving God will allow these sort of things to happen to me? Or would a God of love cause this? 
choose this for me to experience, to teach me something, to lead me somewhere. And ultimately, why, why would God do this? I, I can't answer that for each of you. I think we all come to our own conclusions when asking these questions. And we're all going to see it differently, and that's, that's okay. I think that's healthy. But you begin to see the world in a different way that only makes sense to those with the shared experience. And when you go through this, or any difficult or traumatic experience, you begin seeing Scripture in a new light. I'm sure you guys can attest to that. You begin de- or diving deeper into questions that can resemble doubt, but really it's just looking for better answers to the questions that we need better explanations for. And it's in those questions we discover the beauty of Jesus, who meets us there in the dark, in the doubt, in the pit, and in the mud. You see, if we want to know what God is like, if we have questions about his love and his goodness, we have to filter all of that through the lens of Jesus. If Jesus is God in the flesh, then he reveals to us the true nature of God through his life stories, actions, and words. And what I found is that Jesus reveals the true nature of God's love and goodness. He is God's representation. He's God in the flesh. Or what my former youth ministry students would say, God with a bod. Jesus, Jesus is the representation of God. And that's who we, look through, who we look to to understand who God is. And it's through Jesus that we can see and know God. That's what Jesus says in John 14 and 15. And I think this matters so, 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 so much because when you're faced with incredibly difficult circumstances... When you're in the midst of the pit, those questions I brought up earlier, those weigh heavily on us. They're virtually unavoidable, which leaves us wondering, what does this reveal about God? What do these circumstances reveal about what I think about God? My friends, sometimes things happen that we can't explain and we can't avoid. They just simply happen. And if you need to blame God, he can handle it. Uh, Some people want to try and explain it away through doctrine or theology, and I think that can be harmful, especially when it resembles nothing like the God we see revealed in Jesus. So my only advice to you is this, if you're in the metaphorical pit, work your way through it. Don't give up. God's big enough to handle all of it, the questions, the doubt, the anger, the frustrations, the hurt, the grief, the pain. He can handle it because he's with you in it. And when you begin working through it, you begin to see things in a whole new way, in a whole new light. We don't become mature in the faith by happenstance. We don't become who we are as stronger and mature individuals by happenstance. It's through the pit that we're refined, renewed, and restored. It's where we renovate our faith and bring healing to our soul. I don't think we're all that different from Joseph, to be honest. You know, Joseph didn't become the person he was because he lived a simple life. He became the person he was because he trusted in the love and goodness of God, even in the midst of it all. You don't get Joseph second to Pharaoh without the pit. And it's the very same love God had for Joseph that propelled him forward, that moves us through the muck and the mud to become who it is we're supposed to be. And we can't do that, though, if we don't move forward. I'm not saying it's going to be easy simple. Joseph's story and our story, it it doesn't have to end with the pit. It's really just the beginning, hopefully, to something bigger and better and more extraordinary. And we won't see it in the moment. Trust me on that one. We won't see it in the moment, but when we're on the other side looking back, we can see the goodness of God in the midst of it all. And it may look completely different for each person, but I promise you, God's immeasurable loving presence is always, always with you. You've got to trust that. 